Most tourists coming to Dirtjin head to Fei It used to be a sleep, sleepy little village with white stupas facing the holy mountains. Now it has turned into a cluster of hotels. It is one of the destination destinations along the inner pilgrimage routes called Kora, with an important temple which according to legend, flew there from India, thus giving the village its name, Feilai Su, the temple that came flying. The glacier descending from Kava Gebo is Minyong, and it's also the name of the village located at the foot of the glacier. If photographing the mountains or visiting the glacier with its temples it's not enough, more adventurous tourists head to Yubong. Yubong is a vill village located in a valley between three of the snow mountains. The main reason for pilgrims visiting Yubong are the holy waterfalls. For tourists there are also other hikes. But the tour I want to take you to is an everyday walk to a local temple. I'm doing the walk with my Tibetan mother, I call, I call her Ama. Today is the 15th of the lunar, ca lunar calendar, time to burn incense branches to offer smoke and prayers to the gods. I had been planning a walk down to Bajur for some days and ac according to Ama, today is an auspicious day for it. The sky is clear blue and smoke is rising everywhere from the incense towers on the mountainsides. Wind blows briskly up here as we start walking. Instead of the car road, we start down one of the main paths to Sidang village and Ama chants prayers as we walk. The pink bas plastic basket is filled with oriental tuya branches which are, the, are for the smoke offerings along the way and at the temple. Now. At the end of January, brown is the ruling color of the landscape. The surrounding slopes are dry and rocky, and the walnut trees are bare. The path is well maintained, as many people still walk instead of driving a motorbike or a car, especially women who do most of the field work and carry fodder for the animals. The fields are scattered in different parts of the village and the landscape is crisscrossed by paths leading to fields and channels for, for watering them. Some fields are turning green as the new barley is rising, but many are still just brown. Those brown fields have been planted with wine grapes and are being turned into monocultures. Many villagers still plant barley maize and other crops in between the rows of wine, but fields rented out to domestic and international wineries are staying brown until the wines start growing leaves. Ronchong village fields, which are lower down and larger, are mostly brown. We reach the main stretch of road through the village and continue walking along the paved road, passing some wine fields. Heavy odor hangs in the air. Tui! Ama spits. Nong yao! The smell is the farm chemical being sprayed on wines. Previously it was often referred to as poison, but people were instructed to call it medicine. We pass the village village clinic and come to a stupa in the middle of the road. By the road there is an oven and Ama places branches in it, throws in some grains and sprinkles it with water or alcohol while praying. I listen to the water whooshing down a nearby canal and a bird weeding. The bird song means that it's going to rain, Amma says. She does not light up the branches as another woman comes to the stupa to do her prayers. 
We continue the road to a viewing platform with great vista over the fluvial fields and the remnants of an ancient tower with stupas and the temple down near the river. I almost missed a little path that Amma wants to take. It used to be the main road leading up from the river. Uh, as we step down from the road, we come to a money stone pile that is several meters long. Money stones are stone plates or rocks inscribed with the mantra Om Mani Padme Om, and they have been placed along these routes by passers-by for centuries. Also, money stone piles need to be circumambulated clockwise. Near this pile there is a l large rock that has been bounded full of holes by people walking by. Amma says that there is no child in the village that has not been hammering holes in it. When she was a child, she had an auntie who lived in De Chin and visited Zidang on weekends. She would walk down the path from Fei Lai Si, cross the bridge and then walk up this path. All the children of the extended family would be wading by the rock, pounding holes in it. Sometimes the wait was long as the and the children would run up to the house to eat and then come back again to wait and make more holes. As we pass another money stone pile, Amma tells how her grandfather also knew how to carve money stones. Her grandfather was a very handy man. He could also sew bags and clothing from goatskins. He died when Amma was nine, but she can still remember the outfit he had made her. She also remembers the taste of fish soup that he used to cook. He lived in the house by the bridge, guarding it, and uncustomarily to Tibetans he would catch small fi fish from the Mekong and cook them, and cook them for his grandchildren. Many Tibetans do not eat fish, and especially not from the river where they throw their dead. Then we come to a water channel and follow that for a while. The sound of flowing water fills the air. During the summer months, this part of the walk is cool as we walk under huge walnut trees. It is a weird contrast with the arid landscape further down the valley. Sand, rocks, spiky bushes and huge cacti. We come to a ramped earth wall made to protect the fields from landslides. Most fields are separated only by ditches unless they are by the main roads or next to steep slopes. Sometimes the slopes are also supported by, by rock walls. Most of the rocks are found uh. Most of the rocks are round, hewn by the river ages ago. As we pass the ramped earth tower, Amma tells as we pass the ramped earth tower, Amma tells her version of the story connected with it. Before the Tibetan emperor and the Beijing emperor want to, wanted to combine their houses, nowadays many Sidang people have been to Beijing. Brother has also been. At that time, the emperor's son didn't want to travel, after all, He's the emperor's son, so he stayed at home. Many Tibetans brought their horses and mules to escort the Tibetan princess halfway to Beijing. And as it happened, the princess gave birth to a son. For some reason, many of these stories of princesses passing through these areas end up with the princess getting pregnant. Amma is not sure where the son was left, 
But when he grew older, he started looking for his mother. On his way to Tibet, he built these towers. He just threw a basket full of dirt and a tower grew there. Ama points up the slope and recalls that there used to be a tower near our old house and one in the village and one one up near the Sidang temple and one near little auntie's house. Those are the towers Ama knows of. Ama kicks larger stones off the path and clears away thorny branches as we walk. In olden days, women would always carry a basket on their backs and a knife when walking. Part of walking was keeping the paths clear and part was looking for food. This part is hardly used anymore and as we hit the new road, we lose it completely. Ama decides to cut through some, someone's wine fields. The wines have just been cut and sprayed and they stand in neat rows supported by concrete poles and wires. This field is also green from the new barley. This shortcut was not the right way and we end up scaling a dirt wall and scrambling down a very steep slope before we, before we, we find the path again just as it connects with the new paved road leading to the temple. First we arrive to several stupas, two of them large and old and 108 smaller ones. The small tupas, stupas were built in 2010 by a group of pilgrims from Lhasa who camped here for a week building them. As I stand taking a photo of little goats eating the spiky bushes, an old lady passes me by and briskly walks around the corner, praying. I follow her and see Ama lighting up the tuya branches. The lady has opened her scarf turban and Ama has removed her cap. As they throw grains towards the stupas and pray, I watch the scenery upwards, the houses high up on the slopes and the smokes rising from the incense burners up there. Sometimes I can hear the louder echoes of the shouts, Yaso! rising above the road of the Mekong. The sh shouts come from the temple and salute the holy mountains. Next to the stupas, there is a key-shaped hole on a rock surface. This is where pilgrims should perform prayers to gain a key to approach the holy mountains. We join the groups of people heading to the temple. In addition to years having their zodiac signs, also days have their signs. And today is the day of the snake which is also the zodiac sign of an important local lama called Guru Chapa. Pashur Monastery is his summer resi residence, and the first incarnation of this guru occurred in a cave here. Unlike most tulkus, Guru Chapa is said to have incarnated from nature spirits. Now the landscape is all sand and rocks. The only greenness comes from the cacti that are taller than a man. Yet the landscape is also colorful with thousands of prayer flags, large and small, fluttering in the wi brisk wind. We head to the ne next offering site where Amar joins others performing prayers prostrating in front of stone chalked white. I don't feel comfortable joining them, although I receive encouraging smiles. But I don't want to disturb the ritual either, so I just quietly soak in the atmosphere, sights, sounds and smells. Then Ama shows me an indentation on the rocks that is a footprint of some holy person. Then we head to the temple where we spin prayer wheels 
and Amma prostrates and prays in front of the holy statues. There is no required order that these prayers and rituals need to be performed in, so people join different groups and greet and catch up with friends and relatives. After the temple, we visit the incarnation cave. As we exit the cave, after prayers and prostration, Amma reads the sign, sign next to it. Pamune, she pronounces the Chinese characters. She can't read the Tibetan script. She only knows how to read and write in Chinese. Now you also know these things. It's written on the sign what the meaning of these places are, both in Chinese and English. Ama doesn't need to tell you these things anymore. I disagree, as we cannot really know that the things they write on the signs are the same as what the local people think. With that she agrees, but drops the subject. Anyway, I insist that we walk through the different formation, rock formations near the river and I want to hear her explanations as these sites do not have any signs. Amma had skipped these on our way because they are not a necessary, necessary part of a kora around the temple. The water of the Mekong is muddy brown. On most winters it turns turquoise blue, but not this winter. When the spring rains start, the river turns blood red. Now the water is low and we, we could go down to a beach of round boulders and soft sand, but decide to skip that. That is where the dead that have water burial are put into the river. Instead, of, instead we walk towards two large, large erratic boulders, hewn smooth and left here by the river. The large boulder and some smaller ones form a hole and you are supposed to get through it. If you can't, it means difficulties either in this life or the next. Amma tells of a woman who circumambulated the sacred waterfall, but didn't get wet. After that, she tried to crawl through a similar hole at a temple near the waterfall, but she couldn't get through. She died shortly after that. Amma, Amma tells me to go first. The rock is greenish and shiningly smooth from swiping hands. As I'm film, filming this, I go through the hole, one leg first, then, then slide through and sit to pull the other leg in. Amma goes both feet first and then through the hole. Then we head to a circle of stones with fine soft sand in the middle. Amma rolls in the sand. While, while rolling, you should think, in the next life, I will not be a donkey or a mule, and you won't. In a stone pillar next to this, there's, there are offerings of white, white prayer scarves and prayer beads and garments. There is also a large stone that the women come to hug if they have problems with getting pregnant. Amma and me both hug the stone and laugh. Then we just need to crawl through another hole next to a large boulder and we have seen all the important places. Just as I crawl through, I see a heart-shaped stone and put it in my back. We head back to the road and I look up to our house. Seen from here, it's far away and so, so high up. As we pass the bridge, Amma tells me that one night, when they crossed it late at night, they saw one bright eye looking up at them from the water. She's not sure, maybe it was the moonlight reflecting back from broken glass bottles dumped into the river. But people also say that there is a creature in the river that has only one eye. 
Who knows?